you know, uh, we're, we're talking about the fundamental currency of uh, nuclear weapons being uranium. And uh, in fact, uh, uranium is a currency uh, that has, um, it's a coin that has uh, flip sides, if you will, of nuclear uh, weapons manufacturing and nuclear power. And the transfer, the exchange of this currency uh, inextricably links uh, nuclear power and nuclear weapons. So the transfer of the civilian technology, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that's playing out uh, today, but the transfer of this technology uh, puts us on the path towards nuclear weapons development. And so um, it's a, um, it's essential to begin the look at banning nuclear weapons by uh, banning the, the, the exchange of the currency that nuclear weapons are a part of and fundamentally uh, link nuclear power and nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons. Um, the, um, I think the idea it's, uh, was politically uh, first identified by, uh, I mean, we're all familiar with the 1953 Eisenhower speech of Adams for Peace in the, in the United Nations. What, what most of us are not aware of is that in 1952, the uh, U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, which at that time managed both the development of nuclear weapons and nuclear power uh, early on in, in the United States, uh, as a government commission, uh, had been developing relationships with the U.S. industrial complex, uh, Monsanto, uh, Westinghouse, Union Carbide, um, Detroit Edison, Dow, you name it, uh, to develop a white paper um, which would uh, call upon the, uh, the American industry to uh, become engaged in national security through the development of nuclear weapons materials, essentially enriched uranium and primarily plutonium, through um, a uh, weapons development process that where the byproduct heat from nuclear weapons development could be used to co-generate electricity. So, uh, and, uh, you know, initially the, the whole premise uh, on nuclear weapons was to um, draw in American industry and initiate um, the process to uh, both develop nuclear weapons materials and in the process to co-generate electricity from the waste heat from that process. And uh, this was uh, primarily looking at like fast breeder reactors like the Detroit Edison uh, Fermi 1 nuclear power station in uh, Monroe, Michigan. Um, but uh, up until even 1986, the um, uh, Washington Public Power System uh, at, uh, Han at, and at Hanford in, in Washington were using graphite, moder uh, graphite moderated reactor that in fact was a dual purpose reactor for both weapons material development and commercial electric power. So um, the idea that Eisenhower presented to the United Nations that um, Adams for Peace was in fact more window dressing uh, for um, a public uh, engagement, a public uh, campaign to take the, the tinge of, of, of the horror of nuclear war off of, of, of atomic power, but in fact they were, they were ultimately linked. So, uh, did you want to uh, well, we talk, uh, talk a bit about the uranium about, mining? Well, I, I just want to mention the Paley Commission. So, okay. Because really, 
to me, one of the most startling developments in the history of this country, really, was under the Truman administration in 1952, uh, because there was a foretelling, if you like, of a future oil crisis, uh, a, an, a commission was organized to look into the energy future of the United States, and it was un under Paley, so it was known as the Paley Commission, and this came back, that what they brought back to the Truman administration was a recommendation, I'll just read the quote from it, um, that nuclear power could deliver only a, quote, modest fraction of American energy requirements at best, and that instead, the commission, quote, recommended, quote, aggressive research in the whole field of solar energy, an effort in which the United States could make an immense contribution to the welfare of the world. So that's where we were in 1952. And, you know, when I think about that, I mean, the mind just sort of boggles that if, in fact, that had been taken up and the U.S. had pursued solar energy aggressively in 1952, we probably wouldn't have climate change. You know, it's, it's that important, that decision that was trashed by the Eisenhower administration, literally in the bin, uh, in favor of atoms for peace, presumably because of the cachet, really, of the tie between nuclear energy and what it could deliver to the nuclear weapons sector and and this is really true you know I'm as you can probably tell from my accent from Britain and in Britain and France you know that ne that marriage between nuclear power and nuclear weapons there's never been a divorce from that they're still completely tied together so we've we didn't break that link in 1952 and we launched into the Cold War and nuclear power development and uranium mining and, and Paul alluded to that, you know, this idea of sort of the, the trafficking and the origin. I mean, obviously, as you prob many of you in this room probably know, the uranium mining that was originally, so uranium's a fuel for nuclear weapons and nuclear power plants, and um, the uranium mining was conducted primarily on Native American reservation Navajo at vast cost in health to those people without being told what the dangers were without getting proper protective clothing or respirators. And that is a horrific story where those communities have suffered, obviously, decades of health effects down the generations, continued exposure because of the detritus that's left behind, and are still seeking compensation through Congress um, with great difficulty because they are discriminated against in rather the same way that they're being discriminated against now in the electoral process, which is, you know, you, you're supposed to have a proper address, you're supposed to be able to understand the documents in English, you're supposed to be able to verify who you are, and that you, in fact, have to prove that the cause and effect is, you know, your, the bonus of proof is on you to show that you got this illness or your grandfather died from this illness because of his exposure in uranium mining, rather than the precautionary principle which would, which would turn the whole thing around. That said, it's by no means changed around the world. So when you look at uranium mining, you know, what's, what's forgotten, of course, is that, for example, France, which depends heavily on nuclear power, gets all its uranium from other countries, did have 200 plus uranium mines, all of which are closed. So all of this uranium is mined in places like Niger and Kazakhstan and to some degree Canada, Australia, mostly by indigenous people who are still unprotected, who are still suffering the consequences. So it, it, it's a big environmental justice issue, you know, as well as a technological issue and a proliferation issue. And, and so I think it's important to remember that the very genesis of all this starts with those people in those arid communities without resources and support. And so there is actually a, a global movement now started in Germany, uh, and if you've been to Germany, you know there's a train system called the U-Bahn, so it's called the U-Bahn, uranium ban, um, and it's to try to get uranium mining banned around the world, so it's a similar thing to the nuclear weapons ban, but to sort of choke off this whole thing at the very start of the process, so that's just, you know, an, an anecdote about the very beginning. Right, and following on the mining of uranium and the, and the milling, um, we arrive at um, another one of the major links between nuclear weapons and nuclear power 
is the um, uh, the enrichment of uranium, where uh, uranium ore is uh, chemically processed uh, to extract the um, uranium U-235, which is the, the fissile material of both weapons and power, um, and uh, where uh, enriched uranium for nuclear power is uh, somewhere between 3 to 5 percent uh, U-235. Um, you can begin to develop nuclear weapons material as low as 60 percent uh, U-235, but um, typically it goes to around 90 percent uh, U-235 for weapons grade material. But um, again, so there we see a number of links in the nuclear fuel chain where the, the idea of um, that, that uh, weapons and power are essentially married and you re the enrichment stage is, is one of those um, in, uh, one of those marriages. Um, the big concern about enrichment um, is that um, and, and we see this playing out in North Korea for example where um, under the uh, non-proliferation treaty, Article 4, provides for um, the inalienable right to... Um, it, to you can read it if you like. Yeah, go the ahead. The inalienable right of all parties to the treaty to develop research, to develop research, production, and use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. Um, and then it goes on to say that it allows the fullest possible exchange of equipment, materials, and scientific and technological information for the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. So that's the open door that's left open by Article 4 of the so-called Non-Proliferation Treaty. Right. And it's exactly how a lot of the nuclear weapons countries have in fact developed their nuclear weapons programs from the so-called peaceful use of nuclear energy, including North Korea. And the other flaw of this treaty in Article 4 is that you can leave the treaty. It's a bit like, you know, you just tell your landlord, I'm giving you a month's notice and now I'm leaving this apartment. You can give notice, I think it's three months or maybe less, uh, that you're planning to leave the treaty and then you can just leave. And so North Korea, thank you very much. We got the technology, the know-how. The, the nuclear power system in place, and then they left the treaty to go on and make nuclear weapons, so they don't have to comply with the treaty because they're no longer members. India, Pakistan never joined the treaty and developed, with a lot of help from Canada and France, their own nuclear power programs, which then transitioned into nuclear weapons. And I think the biggest, you know, if anybody wanted to dispute the connection, you would just point immediately to Iran. Why is there so much concern about Iran if they say they are signature to the NPT? If they say that they're developing nuclear power for peaceful purposes, why don't we believe them? Right? Because that's what they're entitled to do. As far as they're concerned, they are conforming to the terms of Article 4 of the NPT, except no one believes them because they know that they could keep enriching this uranium and they've got all these centrifuges, and so maybe they're secretly planning to develop nuclear weapons. Who knows? But the point is that if you open that door to nuclear power, you allow that pathway to continue to nuclear weapons development. So, which is a, a you know again, um, I guess the question that I would have liked to ask uh, Ira and Daryl is to give us uh, some of their perspective on the burgeoning uh, nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Uh, what, from our perspective. Uh, United Arab Emirates and uh, Saudi Arabia uh, are uh, essentially allied uh, in their uh, uh, political confrontation with Iran uh, to develop nuclear weapons. Um, we're uh, seeing, um, well, uh, United Arab Emirates has actually completed the, f uh, the first commercial nuclear power station in the Middle East at uh, Baraka. Um, there are three more under construction and close to finishing. These are, uh, the, all four of these reactors are from South Korea uh, technology. Um, but um, 
United Arab Emirates has uh, not actually commissioned Barakar Unit 1 because they don't have the regulatory infrastructure in place yet uh, for the oversight of the operations uh, and training of uh, nuclear uh, power personnel. But um, so, I mean, there's, there has been this incredible rush to develop nuclear uh, power in the Middle East. Um, I think, Bert, I think spurred by the, uh, developments around Iran, but now Saudi Arabia has entered into the uh, development with uh, a proposed um, bid for 16 nuclear power stations in uh, Saudi Arabia, and they're shopping uh, out for designs from Japan, South Korea, the United States, Russia, France, but uh, a major scale um, of development, um, and at the same time, while they're a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty to pursue uh, the, the peaceful use, they have balked on making any commitment for um, <coughs> oversight of the enrichment process. Again, this key marriage point between nuclear power and nuclear weapons where Saudi Arabia is saying that um, we're looking to keep our options open uh, given what's going on in Iran. And so um, the, the line is already blurred with Saudi Arabia's development of nuclear power on whether or not their enrichment process um, by, by design will be left open to go from uh, the 5% uh, uranium-235 uh, to uh, weapons grade. And we should say that you know, the, the Iran deal is one of the, it's probably the strictest of any kind of, any of deal of that kind ever in terms of the level of inspection, transparency, oversight of the Iranian operation. They agreed to this. They agreed to be verified and inspected overseen so that the world could see what they're doing. Saudi Arabia doesn't want that agreement and surprise, surprise, the Trump administration is all too happy to absolve them from such an agreement. One of the reasons, I mean, there are lots of reasons as we know why the Trump administration will want to be friendly with the Saudis um, and, and the obvious one is the massive sale of arms but um, it's also because um, Westinghouse, which went bankrupt under ownership of Toshiba, uh, it, there's an opportunity to sell Westinghouse reactors to Saudi Arabia and thus give it some sort of lease of life and, and you know, a pulse still. And so there's commerce to be done. I mean, the, the Saudi Arabian situation, so it doesn't take much to think about, like, why, okay, so why do they want nuclear power? Well, why do they want some new form of electricity generation development in their country? Because they want to export the oil because they're, A, burning too much oil, so if one trusts that they actually care about climate change, that's one reason that they'll tell you that they want to do it. We're burning too much oil, this, the air pollution is too bad, we need to export it. Well, obviously, if they export it, they can make a ton of money, so we have to replace what uh, the oil that we use with something. Now, if you're Saudi Arabia and you need electricity, why would you choose nuclear? It makes absolutely, from an economic point of view and from a weather point of view, it makes absolutely no sense. I mean, obviously you'd go solar, obviously you'd go wind. If you wanted, if you had that kind of money and you wanted to do quick deployment of something that's good for climate change and generates electricity, you would not choose nuclear. It's a mad choice from an economic point of view. And in fact, I always remember then uh, representative and now Senator Ed Markey is one of the few allies we do have grilling the then uh, DOE secretary about why the US was trying to sell nuclear power to Saudi Arabia and he said you know why would they want it Saudi Arabia is the Saudi Arabia of solar and it's true <laughs> you know so clearly there's another agenda there it's obvious what it is Paul just described it you know it's it's this jockeying of 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 nuclear potency in that region with Iran. And, and it's this cachet that's still attached to 
um, and I, I think when it was you that mentioned this at the end of the session, it's this a cachet attached to the ability to threaten to make nuclear weapons that's also in place. It's not just we've got them, it's that we could have them if we so wished. So we're, we've got this and we've got the centrifuges and we're, you know, if we could transition, so that gives you some power. And so it's, it's, it's essential to remove the stigma not only of nuclear weapons as being a weapon, but of nuclear power as being a weapon, or future weapon. I mean, arguably, it's a present weapon. You know, it's a whole other discussion, but nuclear power releases radiation into the air, water, and soil. It, it gives children leukemia. You know, it contaminates people from every stage of the nuclear fuel chain. That's a different argument. But nevertheless, it, it's viewed as a weapon. You know, if you ask the people who were subject to the Fukushima accident in Japan, it's, it, to them, it's like a nuclear attack. I mean, they, you know, they've been evicted from their homeland. It's permanently contaminated and so forth. So the Saudi Arabia thing, I think, is <coughs> probably the best example, don't you, currently, of that right. link and, and, it's, and, and then the nonsense about needing it as an electricity And generator. the importance of trying to stop a new arms race at the very foundation, um, particularly in a tinderbox. Uh, region like the Middle East now. Uh, so that, um, I think that's the, uh, the, the thumbnail sketch of, of, of our presentation. But what we like. about TVA quickly as well. Okay, maybe, yeah. yes, okay. Because it is still happening in this country, yes. the dual use thing, yes. so it's and not I, totally over. Uh, yeah. What uh, I think that, um, uh, you know, as we pictured uh, early on the connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons through the. Um, the Atomic Energy Commission's uh, in, uh, developing a white paper with U.S. industry for dual-use reactors. Today, the uh, Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, which is a federal um, uh, electric power generator, um, is also uh, at uh, uh, four of its reactors, two of which at Watts Bar in Tennessee, are developing uh, tritium uh, in commercial nuclear power stations that it then goes to revitalize and refurbish hydrogen uh, thermal nuclear weapons. So we already have a direct link between nuclear weapons and nuclear power with operating commercial power plants that are dual use for both electricity and uh, the, the, the refurbishment of uh, thermal nuclear weapons. So uh, the connection was, was there and it remains. It has nothing to do with the nuclear weapons sector until now, because now um, there's, the situation that's happening now with nuclear power around the world, and particularly in this country, is that it's closing down. That they're getting old and they're getting uneconomical and dangerous, and so nuclear power is closing down, and, and so it's ceasing to be relevant. And so, therefore, in a desperate effort to maintain relevancy and, and presence, apart from getting new, uh, subsidies to keep them open, they're also making the case that they are essential for the nuclear weapons sector. That and the nuclear weapons sector is essential for deterrence, right? So this is why we have this pamphlet on the myth of deterrence. That, that you, if you buy into deterrence, you have to have nuclear weapons because that's the only way that we can possibly stay safe, this nonsense. So, so therefore, you've got to have the people that know how to work, the, you know, the propulsion submarines, the technology, the know-how, the engineering skills, where are they going to come from? They come from the nuclear power sector. So we've got to keep the nuclear power sector going to keep that flow going and keep people interested in the whole technology and industry itself. And so they're actually overtly now promoting nuclear power as saving us. It's saving us because it's going to keep the nuclear weapons sector going and that's also saving yeah. So they've sort of owned this crazy argument. So that's what we're up against. So now, you know, that's why I think it's really important now to sort of keep hammering away at that connection and also at the core problem which is this, this myth that deterrence keeps us safe. So, but we could, shall we open it to Yeah, I think discussion we'd like to open it yeah, up for uh, dialogue. We don't want to lecture, yeah. 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 And if, if, please introduce yourself and let us know who you are, where you're from, and yeah. yeah well, Robert Mitchell-Sack from Hanover, by the way. I've been reading about the international uh, fusion reactor, I think in France, and people seem to be very optimistic and that there would be even some mini fusion 
plants being scattered all around the world, I, I suspect, uh, coming on in the future. And we've been talking about fission, really, in this discussion so yes. far. Um, what complicate, does that complicate the issue that we're trying to address here today? <laughs> and does it offer kind of a end around or get out of jail free to the Article 4 or any other kind yeah. of agreement? I mean, it's funny that you raise, that's the international, it's ITER is the acronym for this thing. And it's been, I mean, the fusion idea has been this sort of hope and dream for decades. And it's always about 30 years away from happening. And it's remained 30 years away from happening for quite a number of decades, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, first of all, enormously expensive. Second of all, it's not there. So if we're talking about climate change, it's pointless, you know, to spend that kind of money on something that may or may not work several decades into the future. We don't have several decades anymore. We have no decades, no years, nothing no, out of time, right? So it, it's always been sort of, I mean, you know, I think it's, it's interesting from an academic point of view. I think for physicists it's fascinating. This idea that we could capture fusion is irresistible. But as a practical, deployed, useful form of generating electricity, it'll be way too expensive. It won't be applicable to the places that will need electricity if we still are around 20, 30 years from now. You know, it's just not practicable from us on the ground. You know, everything is going to distributed generation, a locally generated renewable. It still creates waste. It's just, you know, the other it's key a waste issue of money. Is, is it's that a waste of money and the whole, re resource diversion. The whole idea of fusion is to bring the power of the sun yeah. to earth <laughs> and you know suspended in a magnetic field for example and when in fact uh, you know it's still going to be an inherently dangerous technology um, in that we've not we've not figured out how to capture that amount of energy um, on the planet so why not just use the natural fission reactor that's already there? Uh, that, and, and we have a 93 million mile safety zone between the sun and the earth uh, to harvest uh, the power of fusion. Um, and in fact, uh, looking at um, just the economics, um, solar power is now the most readily economically uh, rapidly deployable uh, technology for electricity generation that we have. Uh, storage capacity technology is ramping up incredibly quickly right now. You now have utility grade uh, uh, battery storage uh, at 250 megawatts per unit um, that Tesla has, is, is now currently marketing. Uh, for, for utilities to store renewable energy, uh, essentially solar and, and wind. Um, so um, fusion in terms of electricity generation is, is already available through solar power. Um, and as Linda pointed out, has been always ev evasive uh, through uh, trying to capture it in um, in a in a fusion reactor, and dollar for dollar, it's being just oversold not. Pretty much. I mean, yeah, because you know that every dollar you spend on that, you could do so much more. Obviously, with uh, I mean, if you even look at, I think it's in our climate change book. So every dollar that you spend on nuclear power, you could, if you spent it on wind energy, you would reduce six times as much carbon from the atmosphere. So it's just kind of a. I think it's a scientific sort of fantasy thing. I mean, I'm a daughter of a physicist, so, you know, anti-nuclear physicist, so I, I read a little bit about what he wrote about that, and, and he felt that it was just, you know, it's, it's too big, too slow, too late, too expensive, not applicable to the places that need electricity. It's a, it's a fascinating concept in a lab, but it, right now we don't have the luxury to spend those sorts of billions on something like this that isn't going to help anything. You know, we, we're in an emergency. Uh, everything, sh it should be all hands on deck to put money, time, and resources into the things that actually can change the, the climate change. Yeah. I mean, apart from what was talked about earlier with nuclear weapons and nuclear winter, I mean, that's the climate change you really don't want. But, um, and that can, that's the quick climate change. 
But if we're talking about nuclear power and this sort of not so gradual anymore climate change, then it's just a diversion of, of resources that isn't helping. And that's really the argument I think we make about nuclear power too, that if you continue to drain resources into a technology that's too slow, too expensive, creates waste, you know, the amount of nuclear power plants you'd have to build, it just it's not going to happen in time, so why go there? You and again, a proliferation link. And of course, the proliferation link. And, and, and keeping that perpetual door open to developing nuclear weapons, which is really, you know, how do you, how do you enforce a nuclear ban? I mean, going back to Tacoma Park, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll get your question. Going back to Tacoma Park, which uh, those of you who weren't here at the beginning, is where we are and is a nuclear free city. It's one of the earliest nuclear free cities. And it says nuclear free city when you drive in those. Dove logos everywhere, and we went there and we said, look, you know, if you want to call yourself a nuclear free city, you can't buy nuclear energy. I mean, you know, then you're not a nuclear free city, you're a nuclear weapons free city. And the city said, okay, and they looked into it and they purchased 100% wind power. Right? I mean, obviously the actual electricity that comes in the city is not wind, but if everybody did that, it would be. So, you know, that that's putting your money where your mouth is, because it costs them like another 30 grand a year, but yeah, go ahead. Well, I, uh, I'm sorry. I suppose, Go ahead. no, no, I mean, that's in a way what. I mean, there I, are I, groups, obviously, that focus no, separate on. Separate from the weapons yeah. issue. Yeah, I, I mean, mean there, for actually, example, you know, Nuclear Information Resource Service out of Washington. Parts, yeah. these, you know, they're also in Tacoma Park. But, you know, some of the um, anti nuclear groups, if you will, if we can use that, uh, they do uh, maintain a focus on the nuclear power piece. Uh, so we do have. Um, uh, we do have, and a lot of the local groups, for example, um, around uh, site-specific nuclear power stations are focused solely on closing their particular nuclear power plant down. Um, so, uh, I and, think it's and actually, I mean, I don't... I think they're really ramping that up. Yeah, I don't know that that's necessarily the right strategy, and, and, and here's the reason. I mean, there are groups in every country that focus just on anti-nuclear power, and there are groups that focus on just anti-nuclear weapons. And actually, one of the problems is that we've encountered, as a group that primarily focuses on anti-nuclear power, although we make the link between them, is that there are arms control groups that actually aren't against nuclear power, uh, and in fact are for nuclear power. And so it's not true, it's not true that, you know, we're a united movement. And that's actually a detriment and not, so siloing just being about one or just being about the other doesn't work. The reason that Germany has been able to say no to nuclear power, and, and obviously doesn't have their own nuclear weapons, but does have the American bases and would be expected to deploy Albeit Daryl saying they couldn't do it in time, but you know they are supposed to be t participate in in a NATO effort, a nuclear effort, if it happened. But one of the reasons that Germany was successful in politically in being able to say, you know, Merkel c decided after Fukushima, some you know some months after Fukushima, to to say we're going to phase out nuclear power. Politically, she was able to do that because the anti-nuclear power, anti-nuclear weapons peace and pro-renewable movements in, in Germany have always been kind of one. You know, they, they haven't been separate. And so because they've been tied together, um, it was the environment, and because they've had years and years of protests on all levels about all those things, with often the same people, the, the political environment was favorable to that. And in fact, it went extremely well. It became this sort of in my mind, a kind of fantasy land because it became politically suicidal to be for, for nuclear power in Germany. <laughs> I can sort of imagine that. You just wouldn't get re-elected. So um, that, that marriage of those movements, I think, strengthened the ability to get rid of nuclear power. It hasn't got rid of the bases yet, but it has made that first step. So while it's true that there are countries like Switzerland um, that don't have nuclear weapons but do have nuclear power, the countries that are in the you know, in the Security Council, all have both. So that's why France holds on to them. That's why Britain holds on to them. I mean, you know, as a power, Britain is just sort of diminishing by the moment, obviously, with Brexit. But clinging on to this nuclear power, nuclear weapons connection, allows that country to still have some status in the world, supposedly. So I think that's, that's part of it. We're going to just We'll follow up in a second. We'll take that question back. Yeah. Well, I just want to share one more. It's not only that 
MERS, the Nuclear Information Resource Center. There's another group called Beyond Nuclear. That's right? us. Beyond <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, but we do, to, we know, we don't, we, so we do talk about the connection, but we do work, obviously, to try to get nuclear power shut down, uranium mining banned. I mean, you probably know there's an effort at the moment in Virginia still going on. I don't know if the Supreme Court ever agreed to take it up they, or not. They haven't decided yet, yeah. but so, it's, in, it's in the process. So this is a wet environment. Most uranium mines are in dry environments. It's fraught with all sorts of potential environmental catastrophes. This, it may it's be one of the largest land. uranium site deposits in, the in, the, in the United States. And it's in Virginia. So there's a moratorium in Virginia on uranium mining. Uh, the company and the farmer who, who, on whose land it is, uh, you know, he's, he's incorporated with a Canadian company, tried to get that moratorium lifted. That was defeated, thank goodness. But they've taken this now all the way to the Supreme Court, waiting to see if... And it's not about the pros and cons of uranium mining. It's, the, it's about the jurisdiction of whether or not the state of Virginia overstepped its jurisdiction in saying you, you can't go forward um, right. based on the reasons that they gave. It's very, all very legal. When in fact, it's very the, the, the argument out. claims that it's the U U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission yeah. jurisdiction so over the licensing and operation yeah. of this uranium so we'll see. mining. Yeah. So I think the Supreme Court at the moment is not leaning towards hearing it because they don't see you know, they, they can't get inside the minds of the legislators in the 80s that made this original decision to see if they made it for the wrong reasons and overstepped their jurisdiction. So hopefully it'll never actually go through, but it's one of these sort of crazy legal, yeah. When you, when you say uh, wet mining, is that to keep the dust out? No, I'm saying it's a wet environment. So mostly when you mine, it's in a dry, arid environment. Oh, this oh, right. Virginia... Wet environment, so there's a much greater risk of of, of these isotopes migrating into the water supply and oh, contaminating the rivers and so on. So, on the local political level, uranium mining in your backyard should be even scarier than a fracking, or as scary as a fracking operation. Well, the only local uranium mining threat is this one in Virginia. Mm -hmm. But I mean, wherever yeah. it, where it yeah. be proposed. And, uh, well. <coughs> In the yeah. I would say that you know. I mean, I, I don't. I don't like getting into sort of you know. Your problem is bigger than my problem, or yeah. you know, <laughs> arguments. But I think the orders of magnitude of what can happen thing. when you release radioactive isotopes in the environment is probably yeah. But worse sick is sick than fracking. I mean, but it doesn't mean that we like fracking. Oh, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, right, right. yeah. It's yeah. all unnecessary. I mean, it is a right? local issue. It's all avoidable. The local people. Yeah. Have yeah. Their own special yeah. motives, and that's to be Absolutely. recognized and appreciated, even though we should all share the yeah. global. And fracking, of course, does release radiation too. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, let me let me start. But this is an excellent question, yes. and <laughs> I, I think that it's uh, it's it is at the center of the current event. Um, I think that every one of us here in the room will not dispute the fact that cancer is at epidemic levels and rising. Um, we may be making gains on treatment, but in terms of prevention, uh, we're, we're losing that battle, that in fact cancer is on the rise. And um, uh, if you look at the clinical evidence, all the clinical studies show that exposure to radiation um, is carcinogenic, it's mutagenic, and it's teratogenic in that it, it causes um, uh, birth defects um, and uh, you know, mutations. And um, you can't really do a ballistics check on a neutron particle, but it's, it's essentially the same invisible, tasteless, um, you don't necessarily feel it at low level exposures, but the consequences are indisputably damaging. So um, it's really hard to sort out this, the, you know, given that there are so many carcinogens now in, uh, 
in our environment. We are in a milieu of um, of this of a of a effluent that it ranges from not only just radiation, but all you know, even all the way to um, um, non-ionizing radiation, such as electromagnetic fields. So, um, and there's there are synergies in there as well. So, um, I think that, uh, and you know, for me, um, we're for I'm 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 aware of um, medical studies that have found so, so the the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, okay, not an anti nuclear group, um, they did a uh, study in um, southeastern Massachusetts around the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And it was, it was driven by the um, anecdotal evidence of cancer clusters uh, in and around um, the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. And when the, the, when the public health department of the state looked into it, uh, their study showed a 400% increase in uh, <coughs> adult leukemia, a, a rare adult leukemia, that they correlated to the proximity of your residence and duration of your residence to that nuclear power station. And we're seeing um, over 60 studies, medical studies, um, around the world, a lot in Germany, in fact, that have identified the same correlation, that the closer you live and the longer you live there to an operating nuclear power station, routine emissions will have an effect. And principally the concern, as the Massachusetts Department of Public Health determined are pediatric, that children, um, early life development is most vulnerable to the effects of uh, radiation exposure, Princip in, and, which is one of the reasons why we're advocating uh, that the whole measurement of radiation exposure not be based on reference effective man who are, you know, typically stout young workers. Not in stout, nuclear, robust. Robust, <laughs> right? But that it be uh, referenced Healthy. to to pregnant women, yeah. and that's the that's the uh, that's the level where we should be taking the exposures of radiation as the the meta, you know, the threshold. Most vulnerable. Yeah. Mm. But the question was, you know, the, who gets, who's most harmed? That, you know, the nuclear industry harms people the least. And, and so I think that the difficulty with your friend and his or her numbers is, you know, where they're coming from. Because you'll hear people say, well, no one's died because of the Fukushima nuclear power plant. I mean, first of all, how do we know? You know, you've got to track everybody. You've got to correlate the death to that exposure. Second of all, when you're exposed to radiation from a nuclear accident, it's an, it takes a long time to manifest. So leukemia can take several decades before it emerges. So we've got to wait a long time until we can really quantify the and impact. And trans, it can be transgenerational. And it can be too. transgenerational, so then you can keep counting them. So that's why there's so much dispute, for example, over Chernobyl and how many people it either killed or sickened, um, who died, who didn't. You know, And, and we're constantly confronting you know, the, the industry and the pro-nuclear boosters to say only killed 46 liquidators and that's it. And Fukushima hasn't killed anybody and that's it. And it ignores the ongoing long-term impact. So how you quantify it. And then why is this person just looking at nuclear power generation or are they looking at the whole fuel chain? Because you've got to start from the beginning. Uranium mining, milling, you know, processing, the whole waste management, the whole thing, not just the generation. You know, this is how they get away with, you know, we don't release greenhouse gases, you know. But that's, we're talking about the nuclear power plant. We're not talking about the entire chain. You've got to take all that into consideration. So once you run the numbers, the true numbers, and, and they're very difficult to get at, then, then the picture becomes very different, and it's sort of unknown, and it's very difficult to count. Well, people. as far as the, let me just close really quick, because we do have to 
Um, we don't have to run 10 minutes to the lunch though, right? It's just here? Well, I think at 12.30 it's here, and then there's 45 minutes for lunch. Okay, yeah. okay. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll be prompt. Yeah, a few right. more minutes. Yeah. So I, but just to close on this issue, because it's really an important question, and it's uh, the crux of the industry's argument to extend operations and, uh, and uh, build more nuclear power stations. Uh, so the, the issue of, of um, disease and uh, harm from radiation from operating nuclear power stations comes up all the time in licensing proceedings before the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And it, with such frequency that the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, in 2010 went before the National Academy of Sciences and said, let's talk about doing a study to look at the, um, the, the consequences of um, nuclear power plant operations and cancer incidence and mortality. And so the National Academy of Sciences took that issue up. Um, there was extensive debate. We were involved in uh, that dialogue um, in the development of uh, what turned out to be a two-phase study that National Academy of Sciences recommended, which the first phase being to develop methodologies, epidemiological methodologies for studying populations around U.S. nuclear power stations, and uh, the second phase would then be to run uh, two methodologies uh, to see which would be the best or if there was a synergy between the methodologies that would give you the most reliable results, um, and, and subject those methodologies on nine pilot nuclear power stations around the United States. They, the National Academies came up with the methodologies and the steps were moving forward and at that point the, Net, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission withdrew the money. So we had an opportunity um, to dedicate the resources, the science, and um, the motivation to look at the direct consequences of not a nuclear accident, but routine operations. And we abandoned it as, as a government and as a scientific body. And you know that's left us with a bad taste in our mouth because that really suggests that the um, industry lobby effort and uh, actually intervened again uh, to um, basically stop um, an academic uh, and public health initiative that, again, where the evidence is right now um, through state level public health surveys is there is a link and there is a consequence and it can be measured. We just failed to do it on a national level. Yes? yes. Yeah, you you uh, mentioned about the processing of uranium in 1950 in the United States, but I want to say that this uh, uranium weaponization is started in uh, early 1940. Yes. They, they, create, they yeah. made a bomb, and they uh, the first time that uh, yes. that was the first uh, thing. The second thing is uh, you were mentioning about the uh, uh, component and um, that the rumor is is that and again it's unsubstantiated but that Karen Silkwood was on her way to report to the New York Times that it, that um, uh, plutonium from uh, Kermagi was being diverted to the Israeli weapons development program so there was uh, again trafficking uh, between the two countries um, that led to that development. But the Demona nuclear power and the Demona nuclear station is in fact a research facility, 
not a power facility, nor recognized as a weapons facility, but that's really what it is. It's a, it's a weapons development yeah, facility. Yeah, uh, French uh, supply all the technical uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. things yeah. to yeah. Israel. And the United States, uh, as, uh, as you said, secretly or, uh, or uh, how you can transfer that much uh, uranium to weaponize it. Yeah. And it could have been plutonium. And they were able to embed a lot of their own scientists abroad as well. I mean, there, it was a very, there was a lot of help, yeah, a lot of help. We should probably stop because it's, uh, we're at yeah. over time now. We well, thank you, you very much. Thank you all for coming.